Judges 9 is a roller coaster of a chapter, but in the twists and the turns, within the deceptions and the overthrowing of leaders, the fire and the battle, a very clear and a very important lesson is taught. The Lord decrees that those who choose evil are destroyed by evil. The Lord decrees that those who choose evil are destroyed by evil. If you had lived in Israel in the days of Judges 9, you could probably, probably have been forgiven for occasionally feeling the odd round of despair. It's understandable if you consider the shape the nation was in. On one hand, you'd have had high hopes if you'd been born in Gideon's early days. You'd have remembered the story of Gideon's triumph over the Midianites and the optimism and the hope and the 40 years of rest that resulted. And you'd know how the land had changed from a place where you couldn't go near the fields and you'd hide from Midianite raiders in the mountains to a place where it was safe and prosperous. Forty years is a long time. At the same time, though, you'd have this sense of nervousness as Gideon's time as judge continued. As the years roll by, Gideon drifts closer to kingship. And if you knew your Bible well, you would know that was a bad idea. There shouldn't be a king in Israel. But Gideon's acquired all these kingly things, and all the people have worshipped an idol that he made. Gideon has opened the door for the Israelites to reject the Lord their God. And so despite the peace that the land is enjoying, perhaps you'd have these ominous feelings that something is going to go really wrong quite soon. And then here, at the start of chapter 9, Abimelech seizes the throne and all your worst fears are realized. Evil is enthroned and God's rule is rejected. Let's just hit pause on the narrative for a second. Um, Abimelech is Gideon's son. He's the major player in Judges 9. And we've actually been introduced in verse uh, 29 of chapter 8, if you just look back. Uh, It says, Jeroboam, that is Gideon, son of Joash, went back home to live. And he had 70 sons of his own, for he had many wives. His concubine, who lived in Shechem, also bore him a son, whom he named Abimelech. So Gideon has 70 sons, but Abimelech is this extra, illegitimate son. And if there's any more uncertainty as to whether Gideon was taking the throne when he shouldn't, Abimelech means, my father is king. Back into the story, uh, Gideon dies, and in verse 33 of chapter 8, we see, no sooner had Gideon died than the Israelites again prostituted themselves to the Baals. They set up Baal Barith as their god and did not remember the Lord their god. So straight away, the Israelites return to idol worship. It's not a good moment. And we get to chapter 9, and Abimelech has got schemes. Look at verse 1. Abimelech pulls his mother's relatives together at his hometown Shechem and says, verse 2, Ask all the citizens of Shechem, which is better for you, to have all 70 of Jeroboam's sons rule over you, or just one man? Remember, I am your flesh and blood. It's crazy to think that 70 brothers can rule you well, says Abimelech. And along with that persuasive line, I'm one of you, he convinces the city to get behind him in a rush for the throne. Verse 4, with 70 shekels, reckless adventurers are hired to build a squad of mercenaries. And they go from Shechem to Ophrah, to Gideon's hometown. And in one place, verse 5, it says, On one stone they murder all 70 of Gideon's sons, Abimelech's half-brothers. We go from these 70 shekels, it's like a shekel a shot, to 70 dead brothers. A complete display of evil treachery and wicked greed. 
and one brother escapes and will come back to him. But look at the apparent success Abimelech finds in verse 6. Then all the citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo gathered beside the great tree at the pillar in Shechem to crown Abimelech king. And so perhaps you'd look around, but you can't see where a good king might come from. All you can see is the evil man on the throne and the wicked men who put him there. Why would you be optimistic? No one good has any influence now. They've all been hounded out or silenced permanently. And there's an evil man on the throne surrounded by his evil supporters. And it's true, isn't it, that the same phenomenon uh, repeats itself today. You find yourself maybe despairing of the state of a country where you've got an evil man on the throne surrounded by his evil supporters. And you even see this in churches and in Christian organizations where you have types of Abimelech establishing their power base by deceit, by unpleasantness and ungodliness. Perhaps they start well and the Lord uses them for great good, but they can end up leading a country or an institution or even a church or a denomination into the kind of ungodliness that they've allowed themselves to fall into. And there's a deceitful man on the throne surrounded by the deceitful men who put him there. Maybe we could be forgiven for the occasional feeling of despair, the same kind of sense, you know, how can the Lord fix this mess when we can see that all the godly families have disappeared or have folded or have turned to evil? And there's a temptation, isn't there, to follow Abimelech's example to see if we can topple that ungodliness and wickedness with wickedness ourselves. But we mustn't fall into that trap because the Lord has a way of dealing with nations where everything is wicked. The Lord has a way of dealing with societies and institutions and organizations where everything is corrupt. Judges 9 shows us what God does. He doesn't necessarily raise up somebody good to defeat the evil. He can just turn the evil against itself. If everybody has turned against him, he doesn't despair. God doesn't say, what shall I do? God just turns the evil in on itself. The Lord decrees that those who choose evil are destroyed by evil. In Habakkuk 2, God says, Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by crime. Woe to him who builds a town, who founds a city, who establishes a society or gets control of an institution by ungodliness and deceit and violence because he's going to lose it by ungodliness and deceit and violence. The same sort of people who supported him on the way up will bring him down and those who supported him on the up will be brought down by his collapse as well. That's what the Lord will do. And it is the Lord who does it. It isn't that evil in itself can save the day. Evil won't keep the world checked and square. No, this is the will and it's the work of the Lord. He makes the evil fold in on itself. He ordains that the wicked bring destruction on themselves and their supporters. If you look at verse 7, you see that the only son of Gideon who survived, uh, Jotham, climbs onto Mount Gerizim uh, during the coronation and presumably looking down on the assembled people, perhaps enjoying you know, their drinks after the ceremony, he launches into a story. And this is the next section Jotham's fable, where we see evil will be destroyed. He tells a fable of the trees seeking to appoint one tree from among themselves to be king. Three trees who would make a good king are asked to rule, but they each in turn decline. They know there shouldn't be a king. 
They've got things to do that they are meant to do. And so no king is found. Verse 14, finally all the trees said to the thorn bush, come and be our king. The thorn bush said to the trees, if you really want to anoint me king over you, come and take refuge in my shade. But if not, then let fire come out of the thorn bush and consume the cedars of Lebanon. The thorn bush says, sure, I'll be king. But Mr. Thornbush gives a warning. If you make me king now, but later it turns out you don't really want me as your king, then things are going to get fiery. Jotham is, is commenting on the reality. He's being used by God to speak God's judgment. He's like a prophet. And the fable ends, but Jotham continues. Look at verse 19. If then you have acted honorably and in good faith toward Jeroboam and his family today, may Abimelech be your joy and may you be his too. And you can picture all the leaders perhaps shuffling uncomfortably and looking down. You know, have we really acted with integrity and in good faith? Verse 20, but if you have not, let fire come out from Abimelech and consume you, citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo, and let fire come out from you, citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo, and consume Abimelech. If you've been unwise, if you've been unjust and walked away from the Lord, if you've buried your integrity and your honor, then you're going to be absolutely ruined by your thornbush king Abimelech. And you will completely ruin him as well. The destruction will work both ways. Maybe ruined is too soft a word. Expect to be consumed by fire, says Jotham, verse 20. Those who choose evil will be destroyed by evil. The book of Judges up to now has been the story of God's patience, hasn't it? Israel sins again and again, but the Lord has mercy again and again because... Israel repents again and again. But there comes a point where somebody can cross the line, where you just deliberately walk away from God. You make a decisive decision not to turn to the Lord. You don't repent and you never look back. And I think that's the point that Abimelech has reached. If you just look back again at 8 verse 23, chapter 8, 23, uh, Gideon knew there it would be wrong for him or his son to rule over God's people. But Abimelech did it anyway. His decision to seize the throne of Israel was a decision to dethrone the Lord God permanently. And God does not take kindly to that evil behavior, neither in the time of Abimelech or today. And so God acts. And Abimelech is overthrown by God's sovereign hand. In verse 22, we see that Abimelech's days are numbered before they even begin. Three years. Welcome to the throne, Abimelech. You're already dead. But but think of it from the perspective of the faithful few who must live under this man. You know, three years is a long time to endure the rule of a tyrant. Because after two years, two and a half years maybe, you'll be thinking about all the mess, all the immoral lifestyle of idol worship that rules the streets, the evil lies and the foolishness that King Abimelech is allowing to pummel your family day after day. And you might say, when is the Lord going to do something? Three years is a long time to see God's people mistreated by an ungodly leader. It's a long time to see God's word mocked, to watch wickedness win and see good overpowered. It's a long time to see the perils of idolatry define the culture. And during this time, you only have the promise of the word of the Lord to cling to. All they had was Jotham's fable. And the question to those faithful few was, will you live by faith in what God has 
promised about the future, even though it hasn't happened yet. These thoughts can, can trouble us today, can't they? We look at our society, our ungodly institutions and schools, our idol-making companies and organizations. We look at our broken welfare states, our weak and deceitful politicians who make fun of the word of God. Even our church denominations caving to the culture year after year. And we might well ask, when is the Lord going to do something? When will God act? But our challenge is to see the future in the light of God's word, to live by faith in what God has promised about the future, even though it hasn't happened yet. God used Jotham to warn the evildoers here that rebellion against his word would end in destruction. And in verse 23, there's a striking phrase. God sends an evil spirit. Now, this is not God doing evil things. Um, Perhaps a better translation would be a spirit of chaos, a spirit of disaster. This spirit comes between the king and the Shechemites, And the rest of the chapter details a a series of tensions and battles um, which lead to both Abimelech and to Shechem's ruin. But it all starts with God. It's his hand that brings the chaos, the disaster. You notice in verse 25, uh, the people of Shechem set up a network of bandits to ambush and rob everyone on the roads. They're trying to destabilize Abimelech's rule and make him look bad. You know, what kind of king can't even guarantee safe passage across his own land? And then in verse 26, another man, Gaal, son of Ebed, moves into the city of Shechem. And Gaal manages to persuade the city to put their confidence in him. He's another upstart king. And a few verses later, we see Gaal cursing the name and the rule of Abimelech, verse 28. He says, who is Abimelech and who is Shechem that we should be subject to him? And uh, we see Zebel, governor of the city, verse 30, uh, agent in Abimelech's intelligence network. He hears Gaal's conspiracies and passes that information on to the king. Notice how this all highlights um, the foolishness of Abimelech and really of anyone who tries to backstab their way into a place of power. Has Abimelech really expected the people of Shechem to be deceitful enough to get behind him in his unjust and ungodly seizure of the throne and then suddenly become loyal and honorable enough to keep him there? Why does he expect them to now stay faithful to him? When Gaal comes into the city with a better offer, of course they're going to take his side and join his cause. They weren't loyal to Gideon before. Why are they going to be loyal to Abimelech now? Dale Dale Ralph Davis comments on this. He writes, There's no fellowship in evil. Evil has no lasting cohesion. It does not care for its own. It only uses its own. There's no fellowship in evil. If you've wheedled your way there by deceit, you'll be displaced by the same deceit that got you there. The people who enthroned you are not suddenly going to catch loyalty. They're certainly not going to catch it from you. The only way to be established is to be established on truth. As the story unfolds, you see things deteriorate very, very quickly for Gaal and the people of Shechem. Verse 39, they fight with Abimelech and his troops, but that's quickly over and Gaal is forced out. And the next day, Abimelech takes on the city and absolutely destroys both the city and the people. Read verse 45. All that day, Abimelech pressed his attack against the city until he had captured it and killed its people. Then he destroyed the city and scattered salt over it. That salt is going to make the soil infertile, possibly for decades. Even the earth is wrecked. There's a tower 
and the remaining people of Shechem have barricaded themselves into that tower. But Abimelech is not foiled by this move. And we see in verse 49, he and his men light a fire to either burn up or smoke out their prey. And in verse 50, he goes on to Thebes and does the same thing he did to Shechem, besieging and capturing that city as well. And we're not told why he takes on Thebes. Possibly that city had uh, revolted against his rule as well. And again, the people of Thebes run into a strong tower for protection. And so thinking that what worked at Shechem would work at Thebes, Abimelech plans to burn the stronghold down. But verse 52, as he approached the entrance to the tower to set it on fire, a woman dropped an upper millstone on his head and cracked his skull. Now, obviously, this is really humiliating for King Abimelech. This is not how a king wants to go, not how a warrior would plan their death. A warrior wants to take on a 100 guys and defeat 80 or so before finally taking one hit too many and dying in glory. Abimelech has almost died, not just at the hand of a woman, but by a kitchen utensil. And we see this doesn't actually kill him, and so opting for assisted suicide, he asks his armor bearer to finish him off before he bleeds out so that no one can say he died in complete disgrace. And that's the end of his tyranny and the end of his deceit. And it ends so abruptly. Nobody cares about Abimelech. Look at verse 55. When the Israelites saw that Abimelech was dead, they went home. No one is going to try and remember Abimelech. There's no glory for him. Verse 56. Thus God repaid the wickedness that Abimelech had done to his father by murdering his 70 brothers. God also made the people of Shechem pay for all their wickedness. The curse of Jotham, son of Jeroboam, came on them. If there's any doubt as to who is behind the fall of Abimelech, as to who turned the evil in on itself, verse 56 makes it crystal clear. God repays wickedness. This story is in part a warning, isn't it? Let's avoid the way of Abimelech or the people of Shechem. Let's not cross that line in rejecting God's rule over us when we exercise the authority that he has given us. Judges 9 is a vivid and extreme story, but it's not a made-up story. And it's not a one-off case of God bringing down a person who has set themselves against him. Anyone who rejects the Lord and chooses to live in rebellion today will be destroyed sooner or later. If you're asking the question this morning, have I crossed the line? Have I rejected the Lord's rule on my life? Well, be sure that no one who asks that question has crossed the line. Come back to God today and ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. But there's also something reassuring about Judges 9. Remember the mess we started off in. It looked like there was no solution to the problem. And when it looks like there's no savior, it's reassuring to remember that there's no evil, too evil, for the Lord to destroy. God can make that wicked nation or company or institution or even church implode. In fact, he can do the same with the entire universe. Look at the manner of Abimelech's death. His skull was crushed. Does that remind you of another enemy whose skull God promised to crush? In Genesis 3, God says, He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. God is speaking there of the Messiah. He's promising that the Lord's final victory over evil will come by the crushing of the serpent's head. 
When Jesus was crucified, evil was turning against itself. Jesus took all the wickedness of his people on himself and all the wickedness of the world conspired against him and evil triumphed against evil and the serpent's head was crushed. God crushed the head of the serpent by piercing the body of his son. And so the Lord has freed the whole universe from the wickedness that ensnared the land of Israel in the days of Abimelech and the wickedness that seems to dominate our lives now and the wickedness that is found in every one of our own hearts. The Lord has conquered evil through the death and resurrection of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together.